Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Covey Lecture Series. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey here at Brock University. So this afternoon, we're excited to welcome Dr. Joachim Schultz, Assistant Professor of AR and XR. Is that XR? Or yeah. Okay, XR. Marketing here at Brock's Goodman School of Business. Uh, Yo is a Covey Fellow, Advisory Board Member at York University's Future of Marketing Institute, and member of Adweek's Academic Council. He frequently publishes in academic and industry publications, and he has presented his research and insights at over 30 international conferences and industry events. Joachim is an expert on marketing and branding in digitally infused and hyper-connected societies. His research helps marketers tell epic brand stories leverage social media firestorms for building brand value, develop and execute always-on influencer marketing strategies, and engage consumers through AR and metaverse uh, experiences. So please join me in welcoming you for a, a, a great, insightful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, so as Debbie said, my name is Yo, and um, I've always kind of got interested in brand storytelling. I mean, branding and definitely, <laughs> as you know, storytelling, that's kind of, it seems to be like the marketing paradigm right now. When you walk to a conference, when you talk to a consultant, when you just kind of hang out with your marketing friends, I promise they might have some kind of time say storytelling. Uh, but then look into what advice is often offered on storytelling. And I would say it ranges from the more obvious, to the less helpful, to the even dangerous. And so that's got me started, um, that I wanted to do some research on this and help marketers to become better storytellers for their brands. And in particular, I wanted to help marketers and brands to kind of get, or kind of bridge this gap between the strategy and all those lofty good ideas we often have and then the actual execution. And so what I'm presenting you today is something to fix all of that. It fixes the problem of, of storytelling, it fixes the gap between strategy and implementation by offering you a system, an instrument, and metrics for visual storytelling to really demystify that craft and build powerful epic brands. Now the cool thing about this system is that you don't have to have an MBA in marketing or a doctor in marketing, or you don't have to kind of spend $10,000 or more on some agency or some consultant. With a little bit of training, this is what you can do yourself in-house as a marketer, as an owner, as a salesperson, as the HR person, whatever hat you're wearing in your company, this is something you can learn uh, with very, very little effort. It's also optimized for visual storytelling which is a huge part of storytelling, but even less understood than storytelling. But if you think about this, images are everywhere. Like, image is more than a thousand words, right? So visual storytelling is also uh, part of this course. I'm not the only one who's kind of really uh, hyping up the storytelling part. This is Seth Godin, and most people probably have heard about Seth. And he talks about marketing as the art of telling a story that resonates with the audience and then spreads. And, and he's right, by the way. Storytelling is incredibly powerful. It's kind of the, um, please, thank you. <laughs> it's kind of the kind of the, the most beneficial way for us humans to understand the world around us and to process information. We are, as humans, we are predisposed to understanding stories. And there's a whole literature here on narrative transportation. Narrative, narrative transportation is the idea that you listen to a story, you watch a story, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a play in the theater, maybe it's just somebody on the campfire who's telling you the story. And you transport into that story, you identify with the protagonist of the story often, you kind of take their perspective, and you experience the same emotions as they would. And you have like, this emotional reaction to listen to the story. And now if brands are telling a story, that means you also kind of get a connection to that brand. And so therefore we see the forming of brand and consumer relationships. 
stories outside of marketing are incredible, incredible helpful for understanding the world around us because they convey meanings. They also help us to express ourselves and to see where we fit in in the world. Like stories, as a shortcut here, it's incredibly important. But then this is where we're kind of running a little bit into a problem because I'm sure that you've heard that one before. Consistently tell a great brand story. Right? And you can ask yourself, like, when was the last time I heard this? I promise it's probably not too long ago. Like, every time you talk to somebody, they will tell you, consistently tell a great brand story. And the first time I presented this type of work, uh, I was at a conference at Brock University as well. And I was sitting next to my students, listening to the presentation uh, right in front of us. And that person uh, who was presenting said exactly this. You have to consistently tell a great brand story. And then he moved on to his next point. And I had like a huge smile on my face because I found it ridiculous, to be honest. Because he just kind of said, you have to do this, everybody knows it, but how are we supposed to do it? So I turned to my student and I said, our talk is going to explain how to do this in the next 45 minutes. And that's what we're here today. Because the segment is true, don't get me wrong, it's true, but how do we do this? Like, how exactly are we supposed to tell a great friend's story? And even if you just think about the sentence for like a minute or less, like, you probably have more questions than answers right away. Let's, let's go to a couple of questions, shall we? Let's start maybe with the idea of brand story, right? Uh, what is our brand story? Like, where, where does it come from? What's the content of our brand story? Those are the questions. You try to answer them today. Great, okay. <laughs> what makes a brand story great? In the sense that it kind of captures consumers' attention and emotions, that it resonates with them, and they want to spread it. Remember what Seth Godin said, right? It's marketing is the art of telling stories that resonate and then spread. Then how do we get a story that resonates and spread? How do we make it great? The real underlying question here is, of course, what does our story do in the lives of consumers? If we can answer that, then we can get to the core of what is a great brand story. Like, what does our story do for consumers as they live their lives? Then we have a very innocent word here, tell. It's the shortest, almost shortest word in that sentence, but it packs a punch, right? How and where is the brand story being told? How and where is the brand story being told? Talk. You could talk to somebody, right? And that makes sense. Like, imagine you are in your um, tasting room at a winery and somebody comes in and you tell them the story, and so on and so on. You can also spend a lot of money and have to do some advertising that has a nice 30 second clip and then it tells a story. Yeah, you can tell the story, for sure. Where else can you tell your story? Um, your product, like, like what's on your bottle, both at the back and the front, can tell your story. Like the decoration of your sales room, like even the uniforms maybe people are wearing in your, uh, in your tasting room can tell you that story. So a lot of different places where we can tell a story, but then there are also a lot of different ways of how we can tell a story. You could tell a story through a narrative, and that's probably what everybody comes to mind immediately. But you could also say, I'm trying to tell a story through just a single image. And that's actually more common than you think it is. It, that's actually the dominant way of telling our stories. It's just through a single image. So you don't have suddenly like the whole narrative dropping down, you have just an image. And that's getting a lot harder, right? The next thing you ask yourself is okay, how else is our story being told? Well, you may do a great job of telling your story, even on a single image, but what about your customers? Like they are snapping away and they're taking pictures and selfies and they're posting them and say that. And they're telling your story for you. So like how do you kind of count for that? And how do you make it more likely that this happens then in a way that is consistent? And that's the last bit we want to hear, ask a couple of questions. So what process should we adopt to really consistently tell our story and have other people tell our story? What's the process for this? Something we can replicate. Something we can learn, but we can also teach our employees, for example, or the next 
uh, a person that is hired, or maybe an intern that comes in. Uh, as I said, also, consistency isn't always in your hands, right? So how can we hope that uh, our consumers tell stories that consistently hone into our brand story? So, it sounds so obvious, but there's a lot more questions that need to be answered. And I think especially when we look into visual storytelling, this is true uh, to the core. Like, how do we tell epic stories? When if you look on Instagram, the branded content, 75% is just one single image. And then you put another 12% of carousel posts, so it comes up to like 87%, almost 90% of content, branded content on Instagram, are just images. How do you tell a story with this? Facebook has a very, very similar situation here. Uh, like 61% plus if you count the link posts, if it's like a heading and they have like a banner image, like the end, around the 80% mark. So most of our content are just images. How do you tell a story that normally relies on relies on this temporal sequence. So a story always has a beginning and a middle and an end. And that obviously makes sense, but once we kind of look at the pictures and they don't have that temporal sequence, what we find is that we only have fragments of a story. How can we tell a story if all we kind of put out there are fragments of it? So that very obvious fact consistently tell great brand stories is littered with questions and problems and the four problems we want to address here today are these. First of all, consumers most of the time they don't care about our stories. I'm sorry to tell this but like, it's true. Like, consumers don't care about most of our stories. Also, as I just said, like the static images, they lack any temporal sequence. This is where we have to kind of get creative here, work, uh, how can we create a system that works with images? We also don't want to fall back with our images on very, very tired cliches or worn out formulas, you know, like posting always the same. Maybe not always the same image, but always the same idea. It gets old pretty quick. So we need to have something which is a bit more flexible, that can be kind of create new ideas, but still kind of relying on the same old trusted process. And then last, and this is actually Debbie and I who came up with this at some point of time we met, we talked about like how brands are branding themselves, and we realized we suddenly had a really clear vocabulary to kind of express what we thought about those brands. And it's very, very hard, especially if you work with agencies maybe, or when you have somebody who's maybe more on the creative side in the company versus the other person maybe more like on the strategy or the numbers or the accounting side. They have troubles discussing and relating their ideas to one another. So like we need also a way to explain or maybe even justify our strategy and our actions, maybe to our bosses, maybe to our shareholders, maybe uh, to our um, clients if we're working on the agency side. Now, a couple of ideas here. We're going to see this slide a couple of times. So, uh, like, at the end, we're going to see all of those blanks filled in here. So if you want to kind of come back to it at some point of time, the slides are online. At the very end, you see all of those filled out. Uh, but let's start with the first one here. Consumers don't care about our stories. And the solution towards this is that we want to tell epic stories instead of histories. Epic stories instead of histories. Now, in order to make sense of this, we have to start all the way from the beginning. So, this is not, this is not a quiz, don't worry. Just in your own head, answer yourself the question, what are brands? Right, what are brands? And we talk, we talk about brands all the time. What are brands? Just think about this for like five seconds. What is a brand? Okay. Yeah. What is a brand? So, what I'm, what I'm proposing is that brands are not just like a bundle of attributes you maybe were thinking about. And brands are not just a USP. And brands is not just a memory function in your head or like a memory structure in your head. Things you remember 
Brand is also not just the logo or like the iconography or the colors of your know, company. A brand is, in my definition, a vessel of meaning. A vessel of meaning that consumers can come incorporate into their own lives. And this is how it connects into this whole idea about stories. And so this is super, super key. This is probably the, one of the two most important ideas in this entire presentation right now. Brands are vessels of meaning. Consumers incorporate into their own lives. As they are playing out, maybe some certain identities. Maybe one day I'm kind of this adventurous person, and the next guy I'm a complete family man, and the next guy I'm a professor giving talks. So I'm playing out identities all the time, and I could use brands like, for example, a fancy app, uh, point out here to control the presentation in order to kind of infuse myself with the meanings I desire in my role right now. So brands can help and companies can help this because like when we package something, like for example a cup or when we're drinking out of a Starbucks cup or a coffee wine cup or when we're drinking Fiji water or when we're wearing like a Nike shirt or anything like this, if those products and brands are producing them, they are loaded up with these kind of meaning structures. And I, as a consumer, by using them product, those products, can pull those meanings out of the brand and into my own life. Most people, including many self-proclaimed uh, marketing groups, by the way, they don't understand that. And that's why we're coming to such hilariously stupid ideas like this. This is an actual piece of advice I pulled from the web when I googled around uh, best tips for storytelling. Share the history of your company. That's a ridiculously stupid idea. <laughs> this is exactly where like, traditional advice turns from the obvious to the dangerous, in my opinion, because again, nobody cares. Like, maybe in edge cases. In edge the case, they might care. Like, if you have a super fan, they walk into your sales room or into like, a breakfast of yours and they meet the founder or whatever, yes, okay, it's a few people might care. But if your product is just sitting around on the shelf in a grocery store or in a department store, no. Uh -uh. People do not care about the history of your company. Let's kind of just agree on this for a second. Uh, it gets even worse. Uh, this advice here uh, is. Really bad. Tell your story. You may be surprised, but people want to know what makes your brand or business unique. People are interested in how you started and how you got to where you are today. I would be indeed very surprised if that was the case, because again, people do not care about your brand. It's certain, but it's true. What people care about is themselves and their own dreams and their own lives, and their own stories. And that's how we should think about this. We should think about as brands, of brands as a vessel of meaning that consumers can use as they are the protagonists of their own stories. Now, in order to incorporate our brand into consumers' own stories. We have to have a clear understanding of what are the meanings we provide as a brand. This is where the brand essence comes in. So the brand essence, think about the brand essence as like a compass. Like the compass that defines who you are as a brand. What kind of meanings do you stand for? What is your role in the life story that consumers are writing for themselves? That is the brand essence. Think about it again as a compass. And one quote I come back to, I promise, and I'm not making this up, every second class when I'm teaching social media marketing, I put up this slide. Because it's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's by a book uh, by Mark and Pearson, The Hero and the Outlaw. It's a great read if you want to kind of dive more into like this whole system I'm showing you today. And this quote goes, the best stories, the stories that transcend time and place, are more than simply entertaining. They are in some way useful to us. Useful. They help us work through unconscious pressures and deal with fear, anger, and anxiety. Um, and they lend expression to those deep yearnings we have, even though we might be unable to articulate them. 
that we do about that. You probably know this from your own life. But unfortunately, oftentimes, friends don't tap into these deep yearnings or dreams or anxieties. In this case here, we don't have to read all of it, I just highlighted a couple of pieces about the winery here in uh, Niagara region. It's a 14 acre property, they bought it in 1999. Uh, there's a second farm, there's a 19th century barn, uh, they have quality, um, they uh, have award winning wines, uh, they go spectacular settings, and they realize that we. I'm not bashing the winery at all. I, in fact, I'm a big fan. They, they make phenomenal wine. The problem is that they're not telling that story. They're telling a history. And this history, unfortunately, is not really entertaining, and also definitely not useful for consumers in the sense of what we just saw in that very important quote, where we kind of help to resolve these deep anxieties and yearnings and achieve our personal goals. So on the flip side, I want to show you uh, what Rebel looked like when I worked with them a couple of years ago. So Rebel is a uh, wine company in California, and my previous uh, university gig in California, I was working with them uh, to kind of flesh out what meanings they provide to uh, their customers. And it all started when uh, the owner, oh, actually, I have to step one step back. Like the, the brand used to be called Force of Nature. Actually, this is how the labels looked like then and still look today. And you see here how it says Force of Nature. And I noticed at some point of time that those beloved bottles, because I love the labels, and the Force of Nature also sounds really, really cool. And also tied with my weird research on being in harmony with nature back in previous life. But I noticed that they branded themselves into Rebel. And, and I met the owner, I said, that was pretty cool, and I, I noticed the kind of, um, you know, Rebel. And he was like, yeah, 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 we rebranded we, we, we ourselves. I said, man, that's awesome. I'm a marketing professor, tell me more about the rebrand. And he told me, well, we were called Rebel. Yeah, I know, tell me about the rebrand. And he goes, yeah, we're Rebel now. So he didn't rebrand, he changed the name. That's not a rebrand. Like, rebranding means, like, what new meanings do you provide to consumers? And so we started working on this uh, uh, for, like, a couple of months, like, through, like, a couple of projects we did together. And what we came up with doesn't look the same any longer, because in the meantime, that brand was sold um, to, like, a larger conglomerate. Uh, and I think I'm pretty happy about that. But this is how it looked like after we were done. So on the left-hand side here, you see the web page as it was then, and on the right hand side you see like a section of the Instagram account as it was around like a year, two years ago. And if you guys read carefully, like this little thing he says, like right under the uh, top banner, it says a revolutionary force mobilized by a desire for change. Now that's just the definition for a rabbit. Uh, below that it says, we make wine for people like you, those who love to live, dream, and drink great wine without borders or boundaries. Let's dare to change the world of wine together. So if you kind of flip through this, and it's similar, and we kind of looked into uh, the idea of becoming a member here, and join the movement, become the inner circle to defy the status quo, etc. All of this kind of ties back to a specific brand essence. And let's recall, the brand essence is the compass that defines what meaning does a brand provide in the lives of consumers. And that brand essence, we define uh, as Rebel Wine encourages customers to embrace the chaos in their lives and turn the world upside down through creating micro moments of escape that change the world into a warmer place. It's a mouthful, I agree, but it's still quite concise and it offers us media, like a clear compass of where we're going. Notice also it doesn't talk about the terroir, the estate, the sustainability, even though they do a lot of sustainability work. It doesn't say any of that. It asks itself what meanings do we provide for consumers in their lives 
trying to kind of help them alleviate those anxieties and, um, and, and, and concerns they always carry around them, even if it's just subconscious. Um, there's, like, I could go into like, long detail into why this makes sense for them, right? But the short version is, um, there's a good story about like, two mice that fall into like, a, like, a jar of milk. Right? Can't get out, swimming around in the milk, settling along. And it's like, struggling already for hours, and the first mouse kind of goes like, there's no, I, I'm gonna give up, I'm just gonna drown, and let's go, and it's gone. And the other mouse goes like, I'm gonna hustle on, I'm gonna struggle along. And it keeps, it keeps hustling with little mouse, it keeps hustling, 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 and after hours of straddling in the milk, the milk slowly churns into butter, and the mouse can climb outside. Now that story, is so much the 20th century that pains me. Right? Because it's just not an extreme in the 21st century. Like, how do we know if we kind of put the same approach into life? How do we know that all of that hustling we do to finally climb out of that job in, like that tricky situation in, how do we know this will pay off? If the world is so clearly set against us? Like, have you seen inflation rates recently? Like, that doesn't look good. Or if you, especially if in this region, like this is a California brand targeting to like younger demographics. So in short, and again, you could go into much detail here, but in short, the target audience, they're fucked. They are just really damn smooth. And that whole story about the mice doesn't really help them kind of motivate themselves. They look for something else, and that will actually offer them a third way. You can give up and just drown. You can hustle until you make it, or you can just drink all of the milk, have a good meal, enjoy yourself, and then worry about getting out of the jar later. So like this, I don't care attitude, I'm just kind of living in the moment. That is what Rebel kind of is offering here. Those are the idea of embracing the chaos in our life and turning the world upside down to change the world into a warmer place. And this is nicely reflected, I think, in the Instagram account. So especially maybe like this idea of embracing the chaos. On the right hand side here, you see I'm okay in other lives. Or like very topical back in the COVID days with this toilet paper uh, being stuck towards the wall. Um, oh shit, that was today. Or on a scale of one to 10, how focused are you? Banana. Like all of that is kind of going back into the same brand essence of embracing the chaos, turning the world upside down, just enjoy the moment, having micro moments of escape, and make the world a little bit more fun and warm around you. So all of those images, they, they do kind of, they don't look like a typical Instagram account. They, they don't have like these big photoshops shots all the time. They have like sometimes no product in them at all. Like for example, this this uh, picture of a building uh, in the lower end. But they all kind of form back into the same brand essence. They're kind of loading the brand up with meanings, so that once the consumer goes into a store and sees the rubber brand, they pick it up. They kind of use it as a prop in their own story, and then they even talk about it. They take a picture of it and post on their own social media stories. In other words. What Rebel is doing here, it's telling a story that is useful. It also, you see a couple of more pictures here. It also kind of follows my advice of saying a brand is a vessel of meaning that consumers can incorporate into their own lives by really focusing on the symbolic needs. They're not defining their brand by their function attributes, their sustainability efforts, or their dry farming, or their uh, grape varieties. They, they don't even kind of try to kind of just force the emotional associations onto the customer. Those come from the symbolic meanings you offer. Emotions follow the symbolic meanings, not the other way around. So that is kind of the kind of the, the foundation of this. Brands are vessels of meaning. And now before we go on, I have good and bad news for you. Which one do you want to hear first? Okay, what do you want to do first? Good news. Good news? Really? 
Are you sure? Oh my goodness. The good news is that I'm offering you a way out of the problem that is coming right now. So the bad news is that what I just presented to you is incredibly hard to do, but to make Andrea really happy, luckily there is a shortcut. And that is the good news I'm doing. Right? Good news is coming. And so this is the other super, super important idea of this presentation. The main goal you should have as a brand, if you're thinking about storytelling, is to clearly and consistently express a specific archetype. The archetype is the important word here. That's what you want to do. And this is kind of leading us into the second problem we talked about. Uh, so static images, they lack any temporal sequence to them. And therefore, instead of just kind of bringing our plot lines or even thinking about our brand story in terms of plot lines, we should think about our brand and create character archetypes. And that's kind of the core of the system, by the way. The system is that brands are vessels of meaning, and instead of just kind of creating a narrative-based, plot-based story, we're creating a character archetype that consumers then can take as a prop as they live their own story. That's kind of the, the core idea of that system I'm showing you today. Like creating your brand as a prop in these consumers' own stories, and the prop can be nicely defined as a character archetype. Uh, so, uh, what are um, archetypes, you ask? Uh, that's probably a good question. Archetypes is a kind of more of an obscure term, I agree. It's come out of Jungian psychology. And so the core idea of archetype is that those are kind of these pattern of thoughts that are universally shared in culture. Like not only in our culture, by the way, but across the globe we have very, very similar archetypes. And across or throughout time, they have very, very similar archetypes. Those are kind of, you can think about them as the building blocks of culture. Like every great movie you've ever seen, every great book you've ever read, they are more likely than not kind of building forward uh, on top of some archetypal structure. That's why they are so great. Um, they, they, you, you can think about like every time you consume a story, your brain is working very, very hard. It makes connections between the different words, between the different pictures, between the different scenes. It kind of follows the plot of the story. Like your brain is working hard to make those connections. Uh, are, if you want to go on a biochemical level, and there are synapses kind of working together and shooting transmitters back and forth. Now, if you tell your end story, you have to have the same process. Synapses are firing, etc. If you tell an archetypal story, instead of just kind of sending the synapses down like a little side road, like you send them down the biggest highway you have. So like archetypes are highways in our brain that help us to really understand the story much, much quicker, like an instant. They also are you, we're using them to make sense of the world around us, right? Not even if somebody tells us a story, but you meet somebody new, maybe at a dinner party or maybe at a business meeting, and you immediately kind of figure out like what is this person, what kind of archetype is that person, and how to to understand that person to kind of a little bit predict what this person's like, will you like him or her, uh, will you get along with each other, and so on. Now, as a brand, there is a really important strategic application to this. If you, as a brand, really hone in and become that archetype that what well, your consumers are longing for, you are the perfect match. Again, remember, brands are props in consumers' own stories. They're looking for props they can understand that are useful for them. So you want to be the archetype that is clearly articulated and tailored towards what consumers are looking for. Now, archetypes are around a little bit of marketing. Most of you might have heard around the idea of the hero's journey. Yeah, you did, right? The hero's journey. That is a very important archetype. However, it is a plot archetype. So, in our case, I'm not going into the details, we don't have the time for this. It's an interesting read, but it's not helpful for us if we're especially thinking about visual storytelling. Because, again, 
images don't have any temporal sequence to them, so I can't go through the entire hero's journey, which I would do maybe more in like a movie format or a commercial format. So instead, let's work with character archetype. And that, by the way, comes out of this Mark and Pearson book that I pulled that quote from. And we have 12 archetypes here. There are more, there are subtypes, there are different versions. This is a good one. This one works. This is the one I adopted. I think it's the one which is most useful for us in marketing. Uh, if you stumble on Pierce's web page, for example, which is phenomenal, she also changes the terminology around the quite a bit here and there. So be aware that there are different versions of it. This is the one I use because I think it makes the most sense for us. Now, <clears throat> the cool thing is that those who can express their images, in fact, go really, really quick. Every time you meet somebody, it's very easy to discern, actually, what type of archetype they are. And you have jobs. Explore. Yeah? Wonder about it. That's clear. Hero. The Joker. Jester. Tiger Manister. The Lord. Right, he has this cool quote. He says that he who has, he who must say he is king, is not really king. Because everybody thought of Tiger as kind of the guy who was holding the the who was the boat, who was kind of the king, even though he wasn't. He was just the grandfather of the king in Game of Thrones. Uh, and then he dies. Spoiler. <laughs> so many, many brands kind of utilize these archetypes, not always, I think, uh, on purpose, and definitely not always consistently, but here, if you download those sites, all of those brands have linked to a couple of commercials from them. And, for example, Aviation, oh, we're going to look at Aviation in just a moment, uh, definitely a Jester brand, uh, Calvin Klein's forum, sometimes Lush is more of a lover brand. Um, I want to kind of focus just on one a little bit more in detail, and then two we kind of put the glance over because we only have so much time, unfortunately. But you could dive into this for hours, and that's actually uh, where like, I can send you later on to my web page where you can then spend soon a couple of more hours on that if you're interested. Uh, the regular guy. I, mean, I want to start with that one because the regular guy, you kind of, many of us kind of intuitively connect to that. This is from Starbucks. She's waking up late. I just grabs things, just running, getting a coffee quickly, uh, putting milk, cream in it, running around, um, doing some work, very ordinary activities, right? Dishwasher, not the most glamorous thing in life. Uh, outdoor yoga, yeah, it's nice, nothing against it, but definitely not like outdoor sailing. Uh, another coffee, uh, studying at the library and falling asleep. I think many of us know this feeling. Right, uh, biking, uh, biking around, getting another coffee, hanging out with your friends in the park, uh, or, or studying somewhere at night, uh, forgetting your coffee. Like, I think those are things many of us can relate to, right? So that's the regular guy for you, the regular guy archetype. On the right hand side, you see the profile. The regular guy is all about connection with others and being similar in group not to stand out, to stand, uh, to kind of be part of a group and have this sense of belonging. It really kind of hones in on these ordinary virtues. And anything that is kind of elitist is kind of, kind of put at bay, you know, like not that, not these elitist people, just ordinary people. We're not kind of going like, what would be the equivalent you could do on a Sunday afternoon to go outside yoga, or I don't know, you could uh, play polo. Right? So that's not the regular guy, but the outside yoga is. They are unpretentious. They favor ordinary things. You know, just like a small luxury, like a, a, a cappuccino or something like this. Believe in friendship. Everybody is having an inherent birth. They are conscious uh, about these mishaps that happen all too often in our lives, like sipping in, or like forgetting our coffee or our keys in the car. Um, they're low-key, practical, resilient, hardworking, but they can also relax, they have a common touch, they're not impressing anybody, and they're not trying to. It's all about blending in. It's all about being unpretentious, being unseen. Not everybody is here, they are, or can. And not everybody who is, is it all the time. 
But the moment you want to kind of take on that role, you look for brands that can support you in this role. And Starbucks does this very well. Sometimes maybe you feel like an outlaw. And I have like a, probably a very, un, uh, a very surprising version of the outlaw. You probably think of Harley Davidson, you know, you think of uh, Jack Daniels, and you would be right. Um, but another outlaw is Gucci. Didn't expect that, right? But if you watch that video, you can actually see a lot of weird stuff going on, like from DDSM to spying. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. It's very odd large. Um, you just saw somebody peeking you through some, uh, through some air vents. And Outlaw, I'm mean, not going through the entire profile again, uh, but the more important thing to remember about the Outlaw is that it challenges the status quo and aims to destroy or subvert what is not working. So it's really like the rebel, but with an E, right? Not with an A, the rebel line, but the rebel with an E. That's the Outlaw. It's challenging the status quo, doing illegal activities, or kind of out of the norm activities, subverting the norm, and was usually done. There's also a third example would be the jester. And here, uh, because the jester is amazing. Father's Day. We have to if you don't mind, we're going to celebrate with the mother of all cocktails, the vasectomy. <laughs> Let me show you how to make it. First, fill a tall glass with ice, the way children fill our lives with so much joy. Next, pour one ounce of cranberry juice, sweet, just like their little smiles. Then, pour three ounces of tonic, so bubbly. Then, pour three ounces of tonic, so bubbly, just like I feel every day I wake up after a long full night's sleep. Now, add a dash of lemon juice. Fresh if you have a few minutes to squeeze one, or store-bought if the little ones have you running around a bit today, the little scamps. Finally, we're going to add one and a half ounces of Aviation American Gin, the world's highest rated gin for the world's highest rated job. Yeah. Finally, we're going to add one and a half ounces of Aviation American Gin. Stir. And then we're going to garnish with a little slice of sunshine. Mmm. Now that is as refreshing as fatherhood. Well, something I call the vasectomy for no reason at all. Happy Father's Day, everyone. So, we have to watch this because he's just so well on the chest. So if you look for Jessica, look at anything kind of bad stuff. It's all about avoiding the bottom of life. It's all about living the moment, carefully of consequences, and also a good amount of like telling the truth, especially telling the truth to power. Uh, yeah, that's actually where carnival comes from as well. That's where the, the jester from like Middle Eagle, Middle Eagle Ages come from, like telling the truth to power and kind of finding out like the uh, absurdities and the hypocrisies of life. So as a brand, like choose one of them, maybe maximum two of those 12 archetypes and really focus on this, make that, in other words, the lead archetype. And, and so this is where the good news comes in. So I mentioned earlier, it's incredibly hard to find your brand essence. You probably need help for this. You probably have to kind of talk to somebody who's really deep into branding. Um, because I kind of relate it a little bit to the idea of, of kind of painting. You know, like when you sit down in front of an empty canvas, you have millions of choices what you could even paint and how you move your brush stroke. But with archetypes, you have 12 choices. That's it. It's a little bit like painting by numbers. Right? So you can do that. So in a way, these 12 archetypes, they are your shortcut. So instead of kind of working brand story first or brand essence first, you can just ask yourself, hey, what is the archetype of those 12 that most resonates either with us, then you're authentic, or with the consumer, and ideally, of course, both. 
And I think, bringing it back to the rabbit example, that's what we've achieved. embrace the chaos in your life, turn the world upside down for having these micro moments of um, escape that change the world into a warmer place. Those colors signal that there are two archetypes hiding in there. And those two archetypes are the outlaw and the jester. Now, the outlaw is the yellow part, right? It's trying to set his full and the jester, which is the stronger archetype and the relevant as we kind of devised it. Um, it's about avoiding the boredom of life. And as you can tell, you can then split it up into even sub archetypes if you wanted to the holy fool, the wise fool, or the rebel subtype. And based on then uh, those kind of uh, developments, the system kind of, you actually know to a better extent, like what content would fit your brand. So the benefit is you can draw always like a straight line connection between an individual piece of content and your brand assets. You always know you are on target with this. And once you know this, you kind of see like how this um, very eclectic and very unusual and organic looking Instagram account by Rebelvine actually makes sense. It's perfectly implementing a strategy. And the strategy was focus on the jester in particular, and to some extent, the outlaw as your archetypes. Now, since then, that has changed. Nowadays, they're actually more focusing on the regular guy, which is fine. They can do this. It doesn't matter which archetype you go for, it has to fit your brand and it has to kind of resonate with your consumers. But the consistency is a big part of it. So you ask yourself, what is the best archetype for our brand? That's one of those shortcuts you can do. And then just kind of briefly, because I see you're kind of already hanging in here for like 45 minutes or so, um, the next step then is how can we translate an archetype into actual visual content, which gets to the third problem we have here, without falling back on the cliches or formulas. And that's where the instrument comes in. So the first two points here is the system that you want to kind of be a brand that has meaning, so it can be a prop for consumers' own stories, that's the system. Third one here is the instrument. How do we go from strategy into implementation? And again, this is something you don't have to have an MBA for. You don't have to go around a consultancy for this. You can just do this and learn this by yourself. Because the instrument outlines very concrete and specific visual elements that you can use and assemble together to, from the ground up, create a desired archetype. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this in just a second. This is an old version of the instrument. Don't judge me by its appearance. I'm currently revising it. This one was created for the regular guy and all of the other 12 archetypes based on like a data set of over 1,200 images. In the meantime, I've collected 2,000 additional images and now I'm revising those tables. But you can see how there's an incredible rich amount of details that is defined here. Version 2.0 is coming soon. If you want to hop on my web page and you kind of put your email there, uh, once it's released, I'm going to send you a sneak peek on this uh, so that you can have a look how this new and improved instrument looks like. But just to kind of explain to you how the process works, so you can look at any image. In this case, it's a rebel image. And you can go both ways. You can either kind of analyze your images once it's done, or you can also just kind of use this when you're planning a photo shoot, of course, or when you're selecting images that are lying around on your hard drive. Now, in this case, this I would categorize as the regular guy or gal archetype. And there are a couple of elements you can see on these images 
you know, that kind of lean into this archetype, that you make it the regular guy, help express this as a archetype. These wine spirits here in the lower left and in the center, those are great examples. It, this is a photo that was taken on a photo shoot. That wine spill isn't there by accident. Somebody planned it there. And actually somebody had fun spilling some wine on purpose. Because that's how our normal lives are. Our normal lives are messy. So that's kind of showing the messiness of it. Not like these polished Instagram shots we see all the time. That's fine if you want to be maybe the bon vivant, the lover, the ruler, or something like this, or the artist. Not even them. Uh, but if you want to be the regular guy in your branding, don't show these polished Insta perfect pictures all the time. Uh, the strawberry, just a snack, you know, like a very unassuming snack. It's not a strawberry covered in chocolate. It's not a tiramisu. No, it's a strawberry. Especially in California, you pick those up for two and a half dollars on the grocery market, um, in the farmer's market. Look at those household items there at the top. Those are dollar store quality, and they are used, they are burned. This is not like some olive wood or rose wood kind of fancy fifteen dollars um, stuff from William and Sonoma. This is bamboo dollar store quality, regular guy. That's what we use in our daily lives. The wine glasses are thrift store, second hand. They're not like crystal glasses. They're not like we have like a Bordeaux glass for this one, or we have like a Pinot Noir glass here, or we have like a special glass for uh, maybe uh, a Sauvignon Blanc. No, we have glasses. That's what we have. Maybe we have J uh, Mason jars. That would be also a good choice. The whole entire setting is somewhere probably at home, maybe it's setting, it's not a fancy place. Uh, it leads into the warmer images of things, kind of this relaxed atmosphere. Still with food, not glamorous, again, nothing crazy. If I was honest, like that kappa, I wouldn't buy it, you know? <laughs> it looks a little bit worn out already. Uh, so, like, not super fresh looking, but it fits the regular guy idea. Same with the cutting ball, similar to the utensils above. Used, cut already, and so on. That's a regular guy. Similar here, if we had more time, we could play this out for ourselves, but um, we see pizza. Pizza is like a staple food, right? That's totally regular guy. Again, we see like a very weird wine glass. We don't have specialized glass, but we have just glasses. Uh, we have people fooling around. Those are friends having fun together. Uh, the clothing is very regular guy. We see denim, white t-shirts, flannel shirts. The kitchen is very down to earth. It doesn't have like this complete sterile look to it. It's cluttered. There are things lying around, exposed brick walls, etc. They're eating with their hands. All of those things here in the side, those are those visual elements that are defined by the instrument. And if you want to kind of go like, we want to be a regular guy, you could just go into that table and say like, as we're kind of preparing a photo shoot, these are the things you want to keep in mind. Or, if you're more on a budget, if you're walking around your winery and you see like a cool couple or something like this, or uh, you see somebody who's really on the regular guy, a group of friends who told the regular guy, take a picture of those guys. If somebody drives a McLaren Mercedes in front of your door, don't take a picture of that because that would not be the regular guy. And then those goes for all of the others. This is a creator. We don't have time to go into the details too much, but I just want to show this because it's a nice way to kind of think about the complexity of the instrument. Like on the right hand side here, they like see how the yellow flowers harmonize with the little squeezy ball we have at the perfume dispenser here. How the perfume dispenser itself has also like a very similar shape. Then the perfume dispenser's glass is mirrored by the carafe here, and the top of the carafe on the left here is mirrored with these sharp angles by the glass. So, in other words, we have a lot of mirroring going on, and that itself is a cue for the creator archetype because of the artistic sensitivity that went into composing that particular image. So that is the instrument. So the instrument gives you tons of details for all of those 12 archetypes. 
in order to kind of either select images that you take quickly on the premise or plan in the photo shoot well in advance so you can create consistency in your strategy. And again, like there's a new update coming. If you go on epicbrandstory.com and you put your email down there, um, then I will email you once more information is available. Now, the last problem was how do we explain and justify our strategy? Maybe to our boss, maybe to our client, whatever it is. And here I'm suggesting a new type of metrics, which I call input metrics. So most of us know output metrics, and those are important. I'm not saying they're not. Those are like how many likes you're getting, um, like how, much, uh, how many comments you're having, the click-through rate, and the web page, all of those things are important. Now the problem is that they are not helping you steer the brand that well. Because you're giving all of the control of your brand over to consumers. Really bad example of how this actually works in, to the negative is Starbucks right now. If you, if you look into what Starbucks is doing right now in their uh, social media marketing, they completely gave up, it seems to me. And they're just kind of following the algorithms and kind of doing whatever kind of has biggest traction, but they're diluting their brand image to nothingness. It's really sad what's happening right now. Now, input metrics kind of steer against this. And this is kind of part of this original research, which we've done for the last two years. So we kind of look at different brands and see what they're posting on Instagram, and then we analyze like, how many of the posts go into the lead archetype. Those are the yellow parts here. And how many of the posts are in the follow-up category? Those are the dark and blue ones here. All of the others here are the turkeys one, and the transparent ones are what we classify as non archetype They don't have any particular archetype meanings. That would be just a product they follow against like a colorful background or something like this, or in front of some wine groups or whatever it is. And you see that we have two camps. We have the well-attended brands, where half of their posts are actually on target, and they have very, very few non-archetype. And then on the other hand, we have poorly articulated brands, where only a quarter of their posts are really their lead, which is kind of the same number as the next two together, and the biggest category are non-archetypes anyways. So as a consumer, on the left, I really know who that brand is. I can clearly identify that is an outlaw, or that is a regular guy, because they're consistent. On the right side, I don't know who you are, and then I don't care. You don't help me in uh, playing out my own story. And so the metrics here are uh, like what is the percentage of the lead archetype, your follow-up archetype, your non-archetypes, of course, but also then the ratios. So the archetype consistency measure, ACM, is your lead archetype divided by your first follow-up. And then the archetype strength measure is your lead archetype over your non-archetype. And so the higher those numbers, of course, the better it is for your brand, right? Because you're getting more consistent and you're getting more towards an archetypal brand. And you can compare those numbers. The archetype consistency measure, again, that was lead over follow-up, so yellow over blue, is 3.8 versus 1.6 for the well versus poorly articulated brands. So two and a half times better roundabout for the well performing brands. The strength measure, even bigger, that's a bigger difference, 2.7 versus 0.7, right? I mean, clearly, 26 over 35, that's less than one. Right, so like, especially on the archetype strength measure, you'd want to make sure you reach way above the one, probably at least around the two. And so if you do this for your own brand, you see where you fall. Like those are benchmarks you can use. And then every month, when you're kind of looking back over what you've done in your um, social media um, uh, calendar, let's say, you can go back and say, do we kind of get better ratios? Do we improve our consistency? Maybe there's a month where you don't. Maybe there's a month where you post a lot of, I don't know, updates about new products, and maybe they're not always archetypal. Maybe drop down, but overall, you can always come back to it and say, like, are we kind of on target of creating that archetype we have in mind? And you can even take a post that would be normally a non-archetype and turn it into an archetype. Here on the right, 
both of those posts are pretty much saying that this is the wine we sell and it won an award. That's kind of the content of both, both of those posts. But on the right hand side, you just see the bottle against some unrestricted background. And here on the left hand side, I have context. I have a certain type of base, I have a certain type of wood, I have a certain book. I have the bottle already open and corked shut again. Like all of those are tiny context clues that make the left photo the regular guy, but the right one is an archetype. I would say that those input metrics are just as powerful even more than the output metrics, right? Because they put control back into your hands. They allow you to know that you are on target, that you're consistently creating you as this particular archetype, therefore building meaning into your brands. So overall, uh, those four problems. The first two are really about like what is the system I'm offering here, right? So the system is like tell epic stories by honing in on one character archetype, maybe two. The next one here is the instrument that allows you to really guide your content creation on the implementation level. And the last one is the input metric that also helps you with the implementation, or if you're working for somebody, helps you justify your actions. So as the next couple of steps for you, yes, you do want to create meaningful brand essence at some point of time. I would say that's still the goal, because just that, having that as a basis is going to be invaluable for you. But you need help most likely to do this, and this is probably more on the expensive side. So start in the middle. Start choosing a character archetype. Maybe talk to your team. Let, let's have all of those team members look through different archetypes and decide what resonates most with us. Talk to your consumers, maybe. Who do they are? Like, try to kind of do like an archetype analysis on your best consumers and see what they are like. And then decide this is going to be our archetype. So start in the middle. Uh, and pick the archetype. You only have 12 to pick from, it's not that hard. And then consistently express this archetype through using the instrument and then developing that content through it. A system, an instrument, and input metrics. I think that is something which bridges the gap between the lofty idea of tell, consistently tell great brand stories and then actually how we're supposed to do this. It's something that you can learn for yourself. You don't need to have an agency doing it for you. Uh, if you go on epicbrandstory.com and you put yourself into my email list, I will send you updates on whenever uh, the instrument version 2 is ready. And also, at some point of time in, uh, in the second quarter of this year, I will launch online courses that are available for the public. You don't have to be enrolled in any university. You can just take them uh, from the comfort of your own. And over six weeks, for example, we together work on figuring out like, how you incorporate that instrument into your own brand. And that's what I had. And we have some time for Q&A, I think. Thank you so much. I have a question. Yes, please, Debbie. So, when a company rebrands, is part of that rebranding um, an archetype change, or is that not considered rebranding? Most companies haven't really figured out archetypes yet. So most brands that rebrand probably might either kind of go hard shift or little shift. I would say if you're really serious about this archetype lens and you're doing this, I think there's the benefit of doing it. A rebrand would be shifting into a different archetype for whatever reason, and that's fine, right? Maybe you realize that. Maybe your audience has moved into like a different thing, right? Maybe you find that you brand on a regular guy, but everybody is. But that's part of Gucci. Right? Gucci says, like, why don't we compete against why would we compete against Dior and, uh, and, and Chanel and, and, and all of the other fancy uh, places by also being the ruler or by also being the lover? No, that's just be the outlook. Right? So maybe you find that in the field and then you could shift archetype into that. All right. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. 
uh, for that talk. I'm looking forward to when your your courses um, yes. uh, come online, and we will be um, hopefully offering one of those courses mm -hmm. uh, through Covey um, online. So uh, just a small uh, token of our appreciation uh, for your time and your efforts today. And our lecture series will continue uh, next week on March 8th. Uh, we have cutting principal scientist in virology, Dr. Sid Pujari, um, whose presentation will focus on the importance of a clean plant program for grapevines. So hopefully we'll either see you here in person or see you online uh, for that. So thanks everybody.